keep on announcing that to you. But right now, let's begin the Word of God as we continue our series. And so, as you know, that last week we had a joint service in a, because of Mission Sunday at the main sanctuary. But uh, if you remember, a few weeks before that, we started a new series, and it's called What is Truth? And if you look at the squiggly sign, it's just saying that, look, we're living in a time right now where uh, the truth is really all messed up. It's, it's hard to know what is the truth. Even right now, the outcome of the election, we don't know what's going on. It's going to be a process. It's going to be a lot of things. It's all messed up. The news are saying different things. Different people are saying different things. So sometimes the truth is like that in the, uh, when the world gets involved. God's truth, of course, is very simple. It's right here, right? And we know it. And that's why we want to zoom in into the Word of God. So the first week we begin with talking about when does truth begin? And, of course, we talk about the fact that truth is always begin with God. A truth cannot exist outside of God because God is the truth. Jesus is the truth. So we don't have the truth. Only when we have God in us that we can have the truth. And the second thing we talked about uh, two weeks ago was how is truth revealed? And we said, of course, it's from the Holy Spirit, and that is through revelation, through inspiration, and through uh, illumination, remember. And I want to make a quick, uh, not a correction, but a clarification. My wife brought it up, but I thought about that. I, I mentioned that uh, a, a, a non-Christian can read the Bible, you know, a million times and not understand it because they don't have the Holy Spirit. But uh, there should be clarified, meaning that uh, a non-Christian, a Muslim can be reading the Bible, but the Holy Spirit can, even though he doesn't have the Holy Spirit residence in him, but the Holy Spirit at that moment can begin to inspire and reveal to him the truth, and therefore that's how a lot of Muslims, for instance, uh, uh, come to Christ as they begin to read the Word, even though nobody's evangelizing them, but when they read the truth they, and the Holy Spirit is working at it, they come to know the truth. But, uh, but uh, normally, if a person doesn't have the Spirit, they will not have the illumination and the revelation and the inspiration that uh, a Christian would have, okay? So I just want to uh, talk about it. So today, we want to answer this question. Why, uh, why is truth resisted? Why is truth resisted? Even among Christians. A lot of Christians resist the truth as well. And we want to, Paul wanted to address that from 1 Corinthians 3 that we want to talk about. And so here's my proposition that we're going to uh, talk today. And that is, we are God's fellow workers. And this will make a lot more sense uh, as we begin to read the Word and towards the end. But for now, just understand that we are all God's fellow workers. So go ahead and turn to your neighbor and say, we are all God's fellow workers. Thank you. So let's like to read these nine verses together. And so as, uh, as normal, uh, let's all stand together as we honor God's word uh, and just follow with me, okay? <clears throat> and I, brothers and sisters, could not speak to you as spiritual people, but only as fleshly as to infants in Christ. I gave you milk to drink, not solid food, for you were not yet able to consume it. But even now you are not yet able, for you are still fleshly. For since there is jealousy and strife among you, are you... Are you not fleshly, and are you not walking like ordinary people? For when one person says, I'm with Paul, and another, I'm with Apollos, are you not ordinary people? What then is Apollos, and what then is Paul? Servants through whom you believe, even as the Lord gave opportunity to each one. I planted Apollos' water, but God was causing the growth. So then neither the one who plants nor the one who waters is anything but God who causes the growth. Now the one who plants and the one who waters are one. But each will receive his own reward according to his own labor. For we are God's fellow workers. You are God's field, God's building. Father God, we want to thank you, Lord, for your words. We thank you that for this truth that we will unpack every single Sunday. Lord, I pray that every day we also will dig into your truth because this world is full of confusions. And Father, I pray for peace right now for all of us. And as we discuss about uh, the, the division that is happening in, in Corinth, Lord, as Paul will address, I pray, God, this will not happen in our church, oh God, or among the body of believers. Lord, I pray that, that Christ alone is the one that put us together, that we're not divided because of political parties. And Lord, we know that you are sitting on your throne always. Presidents will come and go every few years, but Lord, I thank you that your words will not, and you are truly the Lord and our Savior. You are truly our president, God. You are truly our commander-in-chief. And so, Father, I pray that we will continue to focus on that truth, O oh God, and not be divided and not live in fear because you are truly our hope. Thank you so much, God. Speak to us now, Holy Spirit, through these words. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Thank you. So, church, just a quick reminder again that when it comes to truth, the Jews always had the truth. You know, they have the Old Testament, they have the prophets, they have the Torah. So they're used to it to know that 
you know, the truth comes only from, Christ, uh, from God. Okay. But the, the, the Greeks, which is the Corinthians, they are confused because they always focus on philosophies, human philosophies. They, they, they're divided you know, because they're following different philosophers, human wisdoms. And so this, this Corinthians, even though they're Christian Corinthians, okay, even though they are united in Christ, but because of their tradition, because of they're so focused on, on philosophers and the different philosophies, they still practice that, but except now, instead of human philosophers as a secular one, they're following, okay, well, I'm a follower of Paul. I'm a follower of uh, Apollos or whoever else, you know, these evangelists, these apostles. And so Paul uh, see this uh, uh, great division in the church. This is the first problem because they deny, they're resisting the truth. And so Paul wants to address them. And this, today's message will answer the question, why is truth resisted even in the lives of believers? So here's the main reason. Number one, it is because of their carnal life. We talk about that this morning in our, in our Bible study, you know, how even Christians, even though they're saved, they can still live a carnal life. And this is what Paul says that we read earlier. And I, brothers and sisters, could not speak to you as spiritual people, but only as fleshly. Notice the word spiritual there that I put in yellow. It's the Greek word uh, pneumonikos, okay? And uh, the word pneuma is where, you know, where we get the word spirit, you know, and, and the breath of God. This is why when you use that word pneuma, like uh, pneumonia, when we have pneumonia, you know, you have a problem with your lung because you're breathing and so on. Uh, you have a pneumatic drill, you know, it means like an air drill. Uh, so it's that, that uh, it's, it's, it's the root is coming from here. And whenever you add the word tikos there, okay, it means it's something that's characterized by or controlled by. So when Paul says, I can't address you as a spiritual people, he was basically saying, look, I can't address you as a spiritual, you know, someone who is controlled or characterized by the Holy Spirit. I can't talk to you as I'm talking to a, a Christians. Instead, he used the word flesh. He says, but only as fleshly as infants in Christ. So the word flesh here is like a physical body, like animals. So Paul's saying that you like, just like animals, you know, you're just reacting according to the flesh rather than the spirit of God that is in us. You know, when you look at animals, when you look at your dog or, you know, I went hunting this past weekend and I saw the deers and the pigs, whatever, they're just acting fleshy. They just uh, uh, move or do things according to their flesh. You know, their, their flesh is leading them. They're hungry, they just eat, and that's all they do. They don't have a, a sense of right or wrong or morality. But Paul was saying, look, that's what you are. I can't even address you like someone who is controlled by the Holy Spirit. Instead, you're so fleshly, and he goes on, he says that, as to infants in Christ. That's a derogatory term. We often use this, the term, oh, he, um, he's a baby in Christ, right? He's an infant in Christ. And we think that's cute. And that's, well, the Bible never talks about, you know, that when we become a Christian, we become a baby first. You know, he talks about children. He talks about young men. He talks about fathers uh, in Christ. But uh, when it comes to infants, it's a negative term that Paul is using here. He's talking about the, the, the negative part of infants or babies. Think about it. There's two particular characteristics of babies or infants that is negative, okay? And one is they're very selfish, right? All of you who are parents know that babies are very selfish. They don't care whether you're sleeping or you're tired, but when they're hungry, they just cry and say, feed me now. And if I don't like what you're feeding me with, I will cry until you will feed me what I want. They're very selfish, okay? That's babies. And number two, babies are ignorant, right? They don't understand a lot of things. They will do stupid things. I mean, you probably heard, you know, babies eating their own poop, right? I mean, they do that. They'll put everything in their mouth, whether it's good or bad. They just do it. And that's what Paul is saying. You guys are like babies. You're selfish and you're ignorant to the truth. And that's why he says, I can't give you, I mean, I have to give you milk and not solid food, right? Because babies can't eat solid food. They don't have the teeth to chew it. And if you give them solid food, they will choke on it and they can die, right? They can suffocate. And that's what happened. When Christians are acting uh, like infants, like babies, they can't handle hard truth, solid truth. You know, as uh, being, I have been a pastor for 30 years now uh, and in, in different uh, three churches, and, I, and there are times when I have to confront people with solid food, solid spiritual food. And, and, and when they're babies, they can't handle it. 
uh, a couple of times I have to confine couples, you know, uh, couples who are living in sin. They're not married, but they're living together, for instance. And I, as a pastor, you know, I address them in a kind way, in a loving way, but they can't handle it. They choke on it. <laughs> you know, not physically, okay? But they're, just, you know, they're, they're just basically saying, you know, some of them, you know, actually many of them will walk away from you. They don't agree with you. They'll leave the church. They will leave the church even without telling me. And when I try to contact them, they won't even respond because they're choking on the solid food. And that's what Paul was saying. You need to understand that when being a Christian, it's not going to be all smooth. You know, it's, it's like marriage. Like a lot of times people think marriage looks like this forever, right? They think, oh, I, I've been there, okay? I, when I was dating my wife for four years long distance, you know, I dream, I fantasize, I can't wait until I get married. Because she was living in San Francisco, I was living in Canada, you know, and, I, and we just do the old-fashioned, you know, ma- not email, they don't have email back then, okay? Mail and phone calls. And, and so I dream, I said, oh, I can't wait until we get married. We will, will never be separated again. We'll be always holding hands together wherever we walk, and we'll always be, you know, smiling and kissing and, and being intimate every single day. That was my fantasy in my mind. But you all know who are married that when you get married and honeymoon is over, right? That's the beginning of real life, right? That's why they say they have three rings, right? Right? There's, a, there's an engagement ring, there's a wedding ring, and there's a suffering, right? That's what happens when you, after you get married. So there's some truth, and that's some truth in that. And so that's what's happening here with, with, with a family, couples. That we have to realize that marriage is not going to be always like this couple, you know, on cloud nine, smiling, hugging, twisting, twirling around wherever they are, right? It's going to be hard. It's going to be ups and downs. There's going to be disagreement. There's going to be fights. There's going to be temptation. There's going to be all kind of things. And so that's why, you know, as Christians, we need to understand that when we become a Christian, Life really begins. It's actually more difficult. It's more tough as a believer living in this world. I want to remind us, church, that we as, as a Christian, when we become a Christian, we're battling about two things. Number one, there's an external battle, okay? That's the, the system of the world is constantly going against the Word of God, the system of God, the, or no, like the, the doctrine of the truth you know, of, of God's Word, Right? Whether it's the, in the universities, you know, the, the, all the things they teach you that there is no God or there is a, it's all about evolution. Whether it's in, at workplace, you know, corruption. Whether it's in a dating scene, in a social media, you know, in every aspect, you know, all the system outside of us is going against us, against the word of God. We're like uh, this, this fish, this salmon, right? They're swimming against the stream, and it's a lot of effort, it's a lot of work to swim against the stream. And we, and the stream is the world, we as believers, we're swimming against the grain, again, against the, the stream. And so we have to be strong, and it's a battle. And this is why James puts it this way, do you not know that friendship with the world is hostility towards God? Therefore, whoever wants to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. We don't want to be an enemy of God, right? But if we become friends, if we become buddies, if we follow the system of the world, we will become enemy of God. And the opposite is also true. When we follow the word of God, the world will hate us. And Jesus talks about that. And then so we are warned, even in 1 John 2, he says, do not love the world, nor the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, three things he's talking about, the lust of the flesh, that's talking about pleasures, right? Whether it's food, whether it's sex, whether it's alcohol, drugs, whatever it is, you know, we want, you know, that's, the world is into the lust of the flesh, right? The world is into pleasures. And I'm not saying that we should enjoy suffering, but I'm saying that they're so focused on pleasures. Like I said, talking about drugs, alcohol, and all these things, that's why they, they, you know, social media talks about that. Every the movies we talk about, we see that constantly because there's a lust of the flesh is of this world. And it talks about the lust of the eyes. This is talking about materialism, 
you know, because they're looking good, whether it's clothing, whether it's car. We were, I was just talking to somebody, uh, you know, a couple of days ago, how, you know, like some people just overboard. Like we talk about Jay Leno, who has like 50 plus cars, you know, and Imelda Marcos, who have 3,000 pairs of shoes, right? I mean, I know that's extreme, but that's, our world is a world of extreme. Our, and, and, and materialism, I mean, when I was walking a few weeks, I mean, if, what? All the Christmas stuff is already out. You know, we, they're trying for you to buy, buy. They say statistically what? 75% of Americans, they use their garage as a storage because we like to hoard. We love to buy stuff, more stuff, more stuff. That's the lust of the eyes, looking good. And lastly, of course, you hear you talk about boastful pride in life. That means, you know, talking about, you know, what is through power, what is looking, you know, fame, position, you know, whatever it is. And that's the, that's, that's the world system. But God is talking about humility, about serving. And so this will have this external battle outside of us. But there's also an internal battle inside of us. Because inside of us, there's like these two dogs that's always fighting, right? There's always fighting. There's a part of us that's all want to do what is right, but there's a part of us that wants that pleasure, that lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. And so it's constant battle within us, right? I mean, we, we want it, but we say, well, you shouldn't do that. Or we shouldn't look at women that way. Or whatever it is, you know. And there's a constant battle inside of us. And, 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 and Paul understood that. And he said that in Romans 7. Look, he says, For I do not understand what I am doing. For I'm not practicing what I want to do, but I do the very thing I hate. And he continues. He said, For I know that good does not dwell in me that is in my flesh. For the willing is present in me, but the doing of the good is not. For the good that I want to do, I do not do. But I practice the very evil that I do not want, you know, do not want to do, basically. So there's this battle inside of us. So, there, so we have this two, you know, uh, external battle outside of us, but there's also an internal battle. So this is why as a believer, it's very, very hard sometimes to, to live in this world. And that's why we need the Holy Spirit. We need the power of God to overcome. I remember... Um, I'll give you an example. Like uh, when I lived in Canada, a lot of Canadians, you know, if we live uh, near the border of the, uh, to the U.S. border, we like to um, go to the U.S. to buy stuff because it's a lot cheaper in the U.S. than it is in, the, uh, in, in, in Canada, especially gas. So before we come back, we try to find the latest, the, the closest gas station we fill up as to the last drop, you know, because gas is half of the price uh, than in Canada. So, I rem- and, but, you know, you, you can only travel, okay, when you travel, I mean, you have an exemption. If you travel a few days, you get like a couple hundred dollars that you can bring in, but if you uh, buy more than that, you got to pay tax. And so I remember one time I visited my uncle in the U.S. and uh, in Indiana, and then t- so I bought new, two new tires for my car, okay, and I bought new tires and other things. And I was talking to my uncle, I said, oh, you know, yeah, I probably have to pay tax because, because I, uh, I passed my exemption, you know. And my uncle, who's a Christian who goes to church, he says to me, well, well you don't have to tell them. I said, yeah, I bought my tires. Yeah, he, they can't tell the difference. I mean, in, I mean, the custom officer in, in the board is not going to check your tire. He won't know. And I was, and I, in, in, my, in my heart, I was thinking, that's true. So I remember when I was driving back, you know, from Indiana back to the border, it's about five hours or so, I was struggling. Here's the external, my, my Christian uncle who says, don't tell them. Why would you want to pay more tax, Right? They won't know the tires is new or not, that you bought those tires. So I'm driving, and I was thinking, as the border's getting closer and closer, it was a struggle, internal battle inside of me. You know, I want to save some money. You know, it's true. I don't, they, he won't know the difference. But part of me says, but God knows, and I know, and, and I'm not supposed to lie. You know? And so there's a struggle inside of me as I'm driving closer and closer to the border, and finally I'm going to line up, and I'm still struggling. I said, you know what? I'm just going to do what is right. If I have to pay, I have to pay. I don't care. So, and I went, as soon as you make that decision, you just a peace inside of you. Whew. So finally it comes up to me and the officer says, uh, you know, uh, citizenship, uh, how many days you been gone? Did you receive or buy anything? I said, yes, I bought some blah, blah, blah. How much? And I said, blah, 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 you know. And I said, yeah, I bought those tires, I said. And he looked, just one? I said, no, two tires, you know. He looked again. And as a pause for a couple of seconds, he looked. Never mind, go. And I said, Hallelujah. And I, and I, and I, so I was driving. I said, Thank you, Jesus. I said, You see, I was ready and I'm ready to pay. I want to tell the truth. And sometimes God rewards us regardless. 
But church, that's the point. There's a struggle inside of us. See, you have to understand, as a Christians, positionally, I talked about this this morning, positionally, we are made right with God. We're made righteous through His death on the cross. But in our practice, we can still be carnal, okay? And that's a dangerous thing. We're made right before God, okay? So when God looks at us, He looks through Jesus Christ, His death on the cross. We're made right. We're clean. We're good. But sometimes we're still practicing our lifestyle is still living in sin, and that not should be so. And Paul talks about it. He says, this is why he says, you got to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. He's not talking about salvation of like going to heaven here, but talking about our practice, our lifestyle. We need to work that out. We need to work out the, the fleshly, the carnality from us so that we can live according to our position as a child of God. Let me give you an illustration of what I mean. You know, when a person gets married, okay, when a man or woman gets married, positionally they change. The man is no longer a bachelor, he, became, he becomes a, a husband, right? And the woman is no longer a bachelor, you know, and, and she becomes a married woman, a wife. So when they say, I do, when it's, it's blessed and they sign the paper, you positionally, you're the same person, but positionally, you're no longer a single person, you are a married man or a married woman, you're a husband and your wife, and even the wife changed their last name. Like Mimi, Mimi changed her last name from Nakano to Ko. She kept her O the same, Nakano, O, and Ko. Yeah, get it? Get it? Okay. And never mind. And so, you know, so they, 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 that's the only thing, right? But persistently, we have changed. I'm a married man. I'm a husband. I'm, and she's my wife. But in the practice, we can still live in carnally, and I still, you and I can still live as if we're still single. We can still flirt around with men and women. We can still commit adultery, you know, as if we still think we're still single, so persistently you change, but practically or your practice can still be carnal. And that's what happened why we end up resisting the, the, the truth, because we're living a carnal life. And what happens is that when we live a carnal life, the second thing that it produces, it produces confusion in our life. And see, this uh, carnal life is like cancer. You know, uh, cancer is a very dreadful disease, right? It manifests itself in so many different ways. My dad died of uh, bone marrow cancer. But some people can die from prostate cancer, breast cancer, you know, skin cancer, leukemia, you know, or whatever it is. It manifests differently, but it's all cancer. So living a carnal life or fleshly life can produce different manifestations. And Paul gives an incredible list here. He says, now the deeds of the flesh, that's the carnal life, okay, are evident which are sexual immorality, impurity, indecent behavior, idolatry, witchcraft, hostilities, strife, jealousy, outbursts of anger, selfish ambition, dissension, and it goes on and on. It's a list of different manifestations that living a carnal life produces, just like cancer produces different kind of manifestations. But I want you to see here the strife and jealousy, Okay, and selfish ambition and dissension and faction because that was the manifestation in Corinth that Paul was addressing. He will address different things, but the first one he addressed was the division in the Corinthian church. Because I'm Apollos, I'm of Paul, and so on and so on. And this is what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 3 that we read earlier. He said, for since there is jealousy and strife among you, aren't you not fleshly? And are you not walking like ordinary people? And then, and then in James, you know, James gives us a reminder for where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there is what? Disorder and every evil thing. And that was what's happening, confusion and disorder in the body of Christ because they were still living a carnal life. And so, church, whenever you have disorder, whether it's in your marriage, in your family, whatever it is, that's not from God. Because Paul says in 1 Corinthians 14, he says that, for God is not a God of confusion, but of peace. So whenever there's confusion in our life, we have to know that, that is, God is not the author of that. It's probably because there's some carnality in us, okay? Or the enemy is putting confusion in our spirit, in our heart, in our family, in our marriage. He did that all the way from the very beginning with, with the, with the, in the Garden of Eden. Remember, look, what, look how he confuses uh, uh, Eve. Now, the serpent was more cunning than the any animals of the field which the Lord God has made. And he said to the woman, has God really said, you shall not eat from any tree of the garden, right? The truth was very simple. God says, if you want to live, you can eat anything except that one tree. 
somebody call it a Google tree, okay? Because you know, it's supposed to be a tree of knowledge, good and evil, so like Google, you put everything you want to know, just Google it, okay? So God says you can eat everything except that one tree, simple. But Satan confused the matter. Did God really say that? Are you sure? Maybe you misheard him. That's not what he really meant. Actually, he's jealous of you. If you eat it, he's gonna, you're going to become like him. He will know a lot of things. You see, he begins to come in. and say, So church, this is what Satan does. It's a diversion. It's a distraction. That's what he likes to do. And this is what's happening to our church, our nation. Right? Our nation is being, you know, all this confusion that is happening is a diversion so that the enemy can insert his lies into our life, into our church, into our nation, and so on. It's all this confusion. You know, the, the truth of our, for our church is very simple, right? We're supposed to just love God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength, right? And love our neighbor and do the Great Commission. That's the truth, simple. But we fight about so many different things. We put so much energy on minor things, you know, not, nothing that's, you know, you know, instead of something that's major. We put more, you know, it's amazing how Christians can know more about their sport teams than they do about the Bible, right? They may know, they can be able to name different players, their scores, their batting scores, whatever their running scores, you know, their basketball scores. They know everything, but when it comes to verses in the Bible, they don't know anything. They're so passionate about their sports, their team. They will even dress up like these guys, you know. They will do everything. I'm not saying it's wrong to dress up like that. But should we not have the same passion and excitement for church and for the Lord, for the gospel, for, you know, spreading the good news? You know, it's interesting. A few years ago, I was listening to Tony Evans preach, and he said uh, he used to be a chaplain, right, for, for Dallas Cowboys. And he says, you know, you know how many hours people spend to watch a football game? Because for him as a chaplain, he just drives straight and they usher in into, you know, into the locker room and everything. But he says most people leave maybe about two hours before the game starts. They got to drive, right? They got to line up in the parking lot. They got to line up to get in. They got to find their seat. They got to go to the restroom, get some popcorn, whatever it is. You know, and so that's a good two hours. And then they sit down, watch the game. The average game is three hours and 12 minutes. So let's say three and a half hours, okay? And then you have to do reverse it again, line up going out, find your car, line up, you know, with your car. Find. So he says you easily spend seven, eight hours to watch a game. And he says, you know how many minutes the actual game is? He says, it's less than an hour. I Googled it, and I Googled, sorry, okay. I Googled it, and I found this. An average NFL game, more than 100 commercials, and just 11 minutes of play. The ball is in play for 11 minutes, and you spend seven hours to watch it. And yet, when it comes to a church, oh, it's raining outside. Oh, the pastor preached too long. It's past noon already. I, I, I'm hungry. I'm, you know, I, I need to go. I can't focus. You know, come on, pastor, hurry up. But when it comes to sport, their sport team, seven hours is no big deal. And pay hundreds and hundreds, of, if not thousands of dollars for a sport game. Church, the reality is that we should be focused, right? The truth is the word of God, loving him with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. See, our carnality, you know, brings confusions, and that's why we resist the truth, and that's why we can't swallow solid spiritual truth, and we only just want milk. Oh, you're safe. You're going to go to heaven. Oh, you know, you're forgiven, and that's all they know about where being a Christian is. So let me end with the uh, good news, and that is the cure. What is the cure for this uh, you know, carnality or the confusion, and you know, why, what is this? And I, I want to use the acronym of FAT, and I know we know it as faithful, available, and teachable, but I want to change it a little bit. Number one, focus on the truth. If we have been distracted from the truth, let's go back to the truth. And in this particular case, Paul put it this way. What then is Apollos and what is a Paul? He said, we're just simply servants that God used to help you believe. Instead of saying, oh, I'm a follower of Paul, I'm a follower of, you know, Apollos, he says, we're, we're just servants. Who are we? He says, I planted Apollos water, but God was causing the growth, he says like that. He says that none of us, you know, whether it's we're the one who plants or the one who waters, we're nobody, we're not anything. 
So focus on the truth, which is God. If you want to be a follower of someone, instead of being so proud of following uh, Paul or Paul's, you should say, I'm a follower of Christ, not a follower of so-and-so. And that's what Paul was saying. Focus on the truth. The truth is God is the one who led you. God will make you grow. God is the one who saved you, not us. Let me give you a few examples to make you sense. When you see a pregnant woman like that, okay, I mean, it looks big, right? And, and, and sometimes I think it's like watermelon. You see, swallow watermelon. But, you know, it's, it's, when you see that pregnancy right there, the man and the woman are involved. That's true. The man planted a seed and the woman provides the egg. But who brings the miracle of growth? There's nothing that the man or the woman can do to make that child grow. It's, it's all the miracle of God. So you don't praise the man. You don't praise the woman. You praise God for the growth that is in her. That's what Paul was saying. I love tennis. That's my favorite sport, right? Roger Federer, he's one of my favorite players because of his uh, one-handed backhand, because what I do is one-handed, and, and he's so good at it. You know, it's so natural. When he does a great shot, I don't praise the tennis racket, right? Oh, Wilson, you are amazing, you know, because of that tennis racket. This is, no, you cannot say praise Roger. You did an amazing work. That was a great shot. You don't praise the racket. Right? When I was in Holland, uh, I visited there. Uh, you may even know about a guy, a painter by the name of Rembrandt. Some of you may know him, but he's a, a famous painter. One of his most expensive paint, painting that he sold, I mean, that was sold, he's dead, of course, um, sold for $33 million. Imagine that. One painting sold for $33 million. When you look at that painting, do you praise the paintbrush? Oh, paintbrush, oh, you're amazing, you know? Look at that paint, painting, you know? It's like amazing because of you. That's why it's worth $33 million. Of course, that's crazy, right? In a way, you praise the author, the artist. Wow, you did a great job and it's spectacular. You don't praise the paintbrush. That's what Paul was saying. You don't praise me, Apollos, or, you know, and so on, so on. You praise, you know, the, the truth, which is Christ, who makes the growth, who save us, church. That's what he was saying. Let me put an application for us today, right now, in our nation. Church, I know half the country are disappointed right now with the uh, outcome of the election, and we, even though it's not settled yet. But I want to remind all of us again the Savior is not Republican or Democrat. The Savior is not Trump or Biden. We have to remember, focus, the Savior is Jesus Christ. He is our Lord and Savior. He's the one who died for us. He is the one on the throne, and He will always be on the throne. He is always going to be our commander-in-chief. He's always going to be our president. So whoever is going to be in the White House for a few years, it doesn't really matter in the sense that ultimately it is God that we worship. It is God that we look into to save America again or make America great again. We need to remember that when we focus so much on the president or the person, we're praising the brush. We're praising the racket, the tennis racket. We're looking at the wrong thing, and that is a confusion, and that's why we get discouraged, and that's why I want to say to you, go back, focus on the truth, and the truth of the matter of this election is that Jesus is Lord, and that's what's really matter, and we need to worship him. We need to focus on him. Secondly, we need to accept the truth. That's what A stands for. We know the saying, you know, you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. That's a common saying that we often hear, right? But there is a stipulation to that truth if, in that statement if you think about it. The truth will never set you free unless you choose to believe and accept it. Let me say that again. You, you, you throw the term, you will know the truth, the truth will set you free. No, yeah, you can know the truth, but until you accept it and believe it, it will never set you free. You see, like, if let's say there is a, you know, a medicine for COVID, a vaccine that we've been waiting for, Let's say there's a vaccine that's produced as 100% uh, successful. You're going to be COVID-proof, bulletproof, you know, from COVID when you take that vaccine. You may know that knowledge, but until you accept it and believe it and take it, that, COVID, uh, that vaccine will never set us free from COVID. 
we will still get sick because we don't believe it or accept it. So we need to. to and so what do we, Paul wants us to accept here? He says, now the one who plants, he says, and the one who waters are one, he says. But each will receive his own reward according to his own labor. It means, church, it doesn't matter what you do right now. Whether you're a teacher, whether you're a pilot, whether you're a preacher, whether you're a missionary, you know, whether you're a bus driver, whatever it is, we need to understand that we you know, all are called to do different things. You know, planting, watering, we're all doing for the kingdom of God, and God will reward us according to the labor. And so we don't have to be jealous. Remember, they were being jealous here, just jealousy and strife in Corinth. But Paul is saying, look, God is going to reward us according to the labor. So don't be jealous of each other. It doesn't really matter. And, you know, it's speaking to me. Because I remember I used to be very jealous of my friends who have bigger church than me. I feel like I work just as hard as him. How come he's blessed with thousands of, 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 of you know, ch- uh, people in his church, and I'm not? And I feel like, does I do something wrong? But I realize this the more and more that, hey, your calling is to be faithful. And if you are faithful to the calling that God has called you, and I accept that truth, then I don't, there's no room for jealousy and strife because God will reward us. Remember that story, the parable, when... Uh, the master was going away for a long distance trip and he blessed, uh, he blessed, he gave his three servants, you know, five talent, three, two talent, and one talent. And when he came back, the guy with the five talent becomes ten. And the guy with the two becomes four, and the one with the one stays one. And then when he rewarded the first two, and notice the reward is very, is identical. To the first one, he says, his master said, well done, good and faithful servant or slave. You are faithful with a few things, and I will give you in charge for many things enter the joy of your master. Then a couple of verses later, he goes to the one with double, but come from two to four, and he said exactly the same, identical word by word. And from there, I feel like God was speaking to me, Ed, it doesn't matter whether you have a church of 100 people or a church of 10,000 people, if you are faithful, feeding, shepherding, loving your sheep, and the guy who with 10,000 church members are doing the same thing, you both will be rewarded the same. He's not going to be rewarded more just because he has 10. The church, the world will. The world will look at him as, wow, he's successful. Wow, you know, he's respectful. He's going to be speaking all over the nations because he has a big church. But I need to accept the truth that God will reward us according to our faithfulness. Not our success. Not according to the world's success, but to our faithfulness. So lastly, the T is basically teachable. So we focus on the truth, we accept the truth, and we need to be teachable by the truth, meaning that we need to apply it and live it out. We need to be willing and able to live it out. Practice it. And this is what Paul says in this last verse. You know, we read earlier, now we, you know, one it plants and one waters, but each will receive his own reward according to his own labor. For we are God's fellow workers, you are God's field, God's building. So church, as I said earlier, whether you're a pilot or a preacher, you know, whether you are a missionary or a stay-at-home mom, we are all God's fellow workers. We are like working in his field, and we are like God's building that needs to work together to build his kingdom. Just because you may not be called a pastor like me or a missionary or an evangelist, you're not, you're not as less important. You're just as important, if not more, because you can go to places where we can't go, to your workplace, to your schools, to do your work as a God's worker. And so I want to encourage us, church, let's do our part wherever we are. Let's focus on the truth rather than, you know, uh, being confused with minor things, minor doctrines. You know, and when, and when in the previous church I was serving, we got so distracted that we had a church split because arguing over the speaker, a retreat speaker. See, every, every spring we had a, a, a church retreat. And then, uh, so I remember uh, introducing the, uh, to the, my leaders, six of us, and I said, here, here's, here's what I have to propose, the speaker. And then uh, I gave them a month to study the speaker and listen to their sample sermons and everything. And a month later, they said, okay, we like him. And, and then, so I book him and everything. After I book him, suddenly half of the uh, the leaders changed their mind. He's too charismatic and blah, blah, blah. 
And then suddenly we began to fight for two years. We couldn't, I mean, there's other things. It, it spread to other things. There was confusion for two years. We fought, we fought, we fought because everybody was selfish. Everybody wants to hold their ground. We right, you're, and, I, and I'm right. And then so we fought, fought until we had a church split because of a retreat speaker. That's the work of the devil. Confusion, distraction. Church, we are fellow workers working in the kingdom of God. You know, there's a rule that says, I don't, you heard, I'm sure you've heard of this before, Pareto Principle, 80-20 rule. They said that 80% of the people will do 20% of the work, and 20% of the people will do 80% of the work, and that includes in a church. Think about that church. Only 20% of the people are doing, you know, the real work in a church organization and the giving, and 80% are doing only 20%. And that's it's a principle that they, they apply in, in a lot of places. And unfortunately, many times it applies in a church as well. Only one in five are truly involved working in the kingdom of God. That's sad, church. Imagine if you come home to your house. Remember where God's building? Imagine if only one out of five things work in your house. You drive home in your driveway, you press your garage button, your garage opener, it doesn't work. Great, so you park on the street. You walk in, and you try to open the door, it doesn't work. You gotta go through the window like a thief, okay? You go inside, and then you, 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 it's hot in here. You turn on the thermometer, you know, thermostat, and it doesn't work. Oh my goodness. You go pee in the washroom, and you flush the toilet, it works. Whew, thank God it works. One out of five, right? You go to the fridge, it doesn't work. You try to take a shower, it doesn't work. Put it a hair blower and it doesn't work, right? Oh, the back door works. That's good. Whew, at least we can open that back door. One out of five things work in your house. How would you feel about your house? Wouldn't you be frustrated? Wouldn't you get, I want to move out of this place or get it fixed? Imagine what God, when he looks at us, when he looks at his church and only one out of five are really working his kingdom. Won't he get frustrated? So let's remember, we are God's fellow workers. Let's work together. Let me end with the story. Uh, a couple of days ago, I was uh, in a conference, an online conference. I was watching Tony Evans again uh, preaching. And he ends with this story that I want to share with you. I thought it was a good applicable here. He was talking about this uh, young couple who just got married. And, uh, and they were driving in a car for their honeymoon at night, and it was foggy. And so the car was stuck behind a truck, and the truck was kind of slow, and the husband was getting a little bit uh, frustrated. And so he kind of wanted to pass, but it's foggy, but he said, ah, okay, I'll pass. So he wanted to pass, and there was an oncoming car. And they had a head collision, and it was so bad that the car flipped a few times and ended up in a ditch. As the husband got, finally came to his senses, he noticed his wife was bleeding to death, he quickly got her out, carried her, and in front of, and when he got up on the street, he noticed that right there, there was a sign. It says that, you know, Dr. Bob Jones, general practitioner. And he thought, how lucky, you know, that I have an accident in front of a doctor's office. So he brought this, you know, his new bride to the doctor's office, and he knocked on the door, and the old man opened the door. And he said, sir, doctor, please, you got to save my new wife. She's dying from an accident. And the doctor looks at him and said, I'm so sorry. I've stopped practicing years ago. No, no, but you got to save her, please, doctor. You know, this is this dying. She's bleeding. I know, but I haven't practiced for a long time. I can't do it anymore. And so the husband says, doctor, there's two things must happen here right now. Either you fix, I mean, you either help and save my wife or you take down that sign. You say that you're a general practitioner, you're a doctor. Take down that sign. That's a deceiving sign if you're not practicing anymore. Church, if we call ourselves Christians, we call ourselves a child of God, then we got to practice. There's so many confusion right now in our nation. People need hope. People need healing. 
And you and I have been called to be God's practitioner, to give them that hope, to heal them, to unite them, marriages, families, whatever it is. Don't say, well, I don't practice. You know, I just go to church. Either you change your sign or you practice. Don't say you're Christian if you don't even practice in it. Let's practice our position that God has given us if we're truly born again. So I want to prepare you right now for our Holy Communion. And as always, before we do that, let's take a moment as you close your eyes and bow your head and ask the Lord, Lord, what are you saying to me today through this message? Some of us here, perhaps you have not given your life completely to the Lord Jesus Christ. And today you need to do so before we take communion. Some of us here, perhaps you know you're born again. You know that positionally you are made right because of his blood. But your life, your practice right now is still very carnal. You're living, leading a carnal life then you need to make a decision. Either you stop or you just say, Lord, I need to repent and ask your forgiveness. So let's take a few moments right now and ask the Holy Spirit, Lord, what are you saying to me right now through this message?